Hello. I'm glad you're able to listen to this message. If you're not involved in a church somewhere, we'd love for you to join us some Sunday at Hope Fellowship for one of our three services. If not, find a good Bible-believing church in your area that teaches God's Word. I hope you enjoy the message. Right on. Lord, we come to you today and we thank you that you love us. Thank you that you've given us life. You're the one who, uh, who lives. Lord, you're the one who's intelligent and powerful. You're the one that made this world around us. We thank you that we can come to you this day, this first day of the week, and tell you how important you are just by, just by being here and, and singing these songs and, and, uh, and being willing to understand what you would have for us in, our, in your word. Father, I thank you that, uh, that each week we can, we can present ourselves to you in a special way together like this. I, I ask that, uh, that your hand would be on this time. Lord, uh, thank you for your word that you've preserved for us, that you have inspired your thoughts, Lord, that, uh, that we can actually read and, and consider for our lives. Thank you that you've revealed and disclosed information about yourself that we can take to heart. Teach us this day, in Jesus' name, amen. I found this, uh, someone wrote into a, a Christian magazine and they, they shared this. This woman said, my son and I were leaving church and after lingering to talk, a woman and her family who had left earlier drove back into the parking lot. What happened, I asked. Well, when I got into the car, I put all this on top of the car so I could help my little boy in. The woman laughed, holding up her Bible, Sunday school papers, and a handful of program sheets. Everything looked rather dirty and scattered. And, she continued, I forgot and left them there as I drove away. Everything was scattered all down Route 857. And my son, my little son, said, well, the Bible does say to spread the gospel, okay? <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about mission this morning. Uh, what is mission? Uh, this, if you would define it in the general terms, a mission is special duty or function on which someone is sent. That's mission. And, uh, you know, when someone hears the term missionary, okay, I'll throw that term out there, missionary, uh, lots of images get conjured up in your mind. You might be thinking in terms of uh, what, what traditionally you've thought of uh, missionaries being. Some of you have met some and are familiar with some, and some of you uh, have this idea of what, uh, what they might look like, maybe possibly uncool, goofy people who wear out-of-date clothes, uh, you know, a life of poverty, sadness and loneliness, a wasted life. You know, sometimes people think of it in terms of a wasted life. You know, they could be doing something more productive. Whatever your view of a missionary is, I need to inform you today that if you are a Christian here today, that's exactly how God sees you. That's how he sees you. If you're a follower of Christ, that's what you are. And uh, it's just a matter of how informed or focused you are. That's just the bottom line of it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 with me. Of us, believers, if you're a follower of Christ here with me today. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. See, at one point, you were not following Christ. You had your own ideas about how to live. And you were very, very comfortable doing what you felt like doing apart from God's direction until he got your attention one day, until your eyes were opened, until suddenly you saw yourself as he saw you, as someone who was lost, someone who had not, not life. And uh, you understood what he did to bring you to himself, that your sin was paid for by God himself in human flesh that he chose to take your place and be punished instead of you. And then, by the power that of who he was, he came out of the grave alive and walked around and people saw him alive. Ascended into heaven. 
and got your attention and you realize I'm, I'm lost if I don't trust you. I want you, Lord. I, I depend on what you did for me to save me. Thank you that you live. I want to live too. And at that moment in time, the Spirit of God came into your life and made you new, made you one of God's people. A child of God who has been brought out of darkness and into the light. And literally, you could see differently than you saw before. That's what happened to you. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. What percentage of the world do you think is, are believers? I would say 5%. That means you are a minority in this world. A small percentage of the world's population of people that God got his hands on and said, you're mine. I want you to declare my praise. The passage we're going to focus on here today is, is uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. You've, if you've been in the faith a little while, you've heard this before. Maybe you've never um, heard a teaching or a sermon based on it before. If you haven't been in the faith a while, this may be the first time. But uh, let me read through this, and then, and then I'll make some comments on it. In Matthew 28, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You realize that as you read through the Gospels uh, of Matthew, you, you read and everything that Jesus did and said, and right at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, after he has been raised from the dead, like a... Double exclamation point. At the end of his gospel, we find this verse. We're confronted here with something that Jesus said. Each person is confronted with something he said. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're a believer or even a non-believing person right now. To a certain degree, everyone is confronted by what Jesus said and who he is in this passage. And the first thing I want to share is this is uh, on the subject of mission. You need to decide who's going to run your life. You need to decide who's going to run your life. In most organizations, people know who the boss is. right? In some organizations, you feel the weight of it more than others. I worked for United Parcel Service for a little bit, and I remember my 30-day trial period. Man, I was struggling to figure out how to do the job the best I could because I knew I only had 30 days to prove that I could do the best I could. And, uh, and I'm grabbing boxes off the line, trying to put them in the right places in the, in the three trucks that I was loading and memorize all the numbers and the spots that I needed to put them. And it was the last day. It was like the 30th day. And the guy working next to me was very comfortable with his job. And I'm frantically grabbing boxes, shoving them in the truck. And, uh, and uh, every time I would come out, uh, the guy would walk calmly out of his truck next to me and said, he's watching you. Go back in the store. I'm going, where are you watching me? I'm grabbing boxes, running in my truck. I come out again. He's watching you. And I come back again. And sure enough, I come out. Where is he? Where is he? You know? He says, right up there, man. He's right up there. And sure enough, I come running out of the truck and I grab some boxes and I look in a high and lofty place up on the catwalk. Above it all was my boss. That's what he was doing. He was just staring at me. Staring at me. And I'm like, that pressure was crazy pressure. And by the, end of the, by the end of the day, he came up to me with that serious look on his face. He says, I think we're going to keep you. woo You know, the boss. And here in this, this passage, the boss of all things, the one who made everything that exists, the one who has the ability to do anything he wishes, he has the ability to alter the course of the world. He has the ability to interrupt nature. He has the ability to adjust the circumstances of your life. Look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 6. He says, I'm the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. 
And as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're continually confronted with this person. And you're challenged to ask the question, who is this person? And we need to make a decision about him. What does he have to do with my life? What does he have to do with my life? Believers and unbelievers alike. John chapter 10, verse 30, for, a, for one example out of this. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. They knew exactly what he was saying. But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, in their understanding, a mere man, claim to be God. We're, we're, we're confronted with statements that Jesus made continually, and we're asked the question, who is he? Who is he? And here at the very end of Matthew's gospel, as I said, like an exclamation point, maybe two or three of them, is this statement Look at verse 17 and 18. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now to a, a, a Jewish person, you know, they're very familiar with the Ten Commandments. Uh, I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of slavery, out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in the heavens above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There's one thing that was, that was uh, uh, beat into their heads from an, uh, uh, youngest of years, is that there is only one true and living God who is worthy of worship. And these men worshipped Jesus. They worshipped him. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's someone we need to make a decision about. Who's going to run our life? Who's going to run our life? You know, who is he? And then the 11 decided to worship him. Have you, and the question under this point is, have you made a decision? Have you made a decision personally in your life that Jesus is in charge? And sometimes believers um, can fool themselves into thinking that he is, but he really isn't. They'll, they'll allow him to be at certain times, but maybe when it comes to real, real difficult choices in life, hard things, they take charge. Because they're not willing to adjust their life that way, you see. And to an unbelieving person, who is running your life? Who's worthy of it? If you're the one running your life and you finally show up in heaven and you realize Jesus should have been, it's too late. It's too late. You realize you should have trusted him. The second point I want to make is this. Choose to catch people for Jesus. Choose to catch people for him. I found this story years ago and I, I just get a kick out of it, so I, I share it every now and then. I'll read it to you. It was, it was in a, a magazine article. Jens Olvsen was fishing for salmon in central Norway's Gaula River when he was swept away by a strong current. Kel Willemsen, 55 years old, spotted the man's struggle. Willemsen had fished the river for 25 years and knew where the current would carry Olvsen. Willemsen ran across the bridge, waiting for Olvsen as the current carried him downriver. Willemsen later told the newspaper he seemed paralyzed. Only his face and the tips of his boots were above water. I decided to start casting. His homemade lure hooked Olfsen's rubber waders on the first cast of about 10 yards. But Olfsen weighed nearly 250 pounds. Willemsen used every trick he knew to reel in the big man without breaking his light line. And he landed the half-conscious Dane and hauled him onto the shore. Ovsen survived the ordeal. I love that story. I love it. Casting for a man and reeling him in on light line. Fighting and finally getting him to shore. In Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 seems to capture the concept for us. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with 
the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, uh, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they, they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the large catch of fish they had taken. What a reaction he had. What a reaction he had. Suddenly his eyes were opened to something. And here he was before someone who could command nature and supply anything he needed. Not just what he needed, but overflowing abundance of what he needed for his business. And Jesus was pleased to do it. And here, Peter all along might have been thinking, this is just a mere man. Maybe he's got a special blessing of God on his life. But at that moment in time, he saw him nothing less as God himself, I believe. As someone who was perfect. And he saw himself as someone who was imperfect and unworthy to be in the presence of this person. And wanted to be away from him. He felt filthy. He felt dirty. He felt like he couldn't measure up. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. In verse 10. And so were James and John, the son of Ze sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. They were astonished as well. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. They were suddenly confronted with the giver of all gifts. Weren't they? The giver of all gifts. And you in your life have prayed and asked God if you're a follower of Christ for some things, and he's given them to you. He's blessed you with certain things. He's blessed you with uh, uh, the, uh, maybe a job opening or the finances you've needed at just the right time in different cases. And, and you've appreciated him for these things. And but I want to say this. There's a point when you stop living for what the master can give you when you stop living for what the master can give you and start, and start living for what he cares about, you see. There, there's, a, there's a point where you just say, Lord, my prayers are going to change. I know you can supply my needs and I thank you for it. But I want to live for what you care about, what's on your heart. What is it that's on your heart, Lord? And Jesus said it very simply to them. I'm going to help you catch men. I want you involved with people. I don't know what, care what you do, but I want your central focus to be involved with people. And their response was, we're in. We're in. And we're in with our life. You know, We're in with everything. And look at verse 19 and 20 of Matthew chapter 28. Therefore, go. And it's interesting, that word there, go, is not just uh, leave right now and go somewhere else. It's along the way of life as you're going. As you're living your life. As you are on your way of life. And what does he say? He says, make disciples of all nations. He wants you to influence people to become followers of his. You can't make someone a believer. But you certainly can influence them. And... And, uh, you know, the common term for a believer in that, in the, at that time was a disciple. It was literally someone, a disciple, someone who would follow a master around, a teacher, a rabbi, and learn from him. Not only the words, but follow their life and understand what they're, uh, what they're all about and how they're living it out. 
And so uh, he, wants, he wants them, us, along the way of life to influence people to be followers of Christ. And take the opportunities to share about that. Help them to come into a relationship with God. And he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. There's two, two things involved in, in influencing people to follow Christ. When they become a follower of Christ, they become baptized. It's extremely important. It seems to be a test of obedience that God lays out there right away. If someone says, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not into that. I can't do that. It shows where their heart is. They're not willing to obey what God told them to do. That's what baptism is all about. It's an obedience test. And baptism is, is simply something uh, that means to immerse or to dip. And that's why we immerse people underwater and bring them back out again. It's like they're identified with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, if you read Romans 6. And so they're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three different gods, three different persons within the true and living God who is one. That teaching of the Trinity, if you've heard that term, but the term isn't used here, the concept is. Three individual persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one true and living God. Not three different gods. We baptize them, that's how we make a follower of Jesus, and also... We teach them to obey everything that he's commanded. Now, does it mean, uh, that, does it mean that they just, they just get a lot of Bible information? You've got to get Bible information into their heads. Is that what he's talking about? No, if we're not acting on the information in our heads, then there's something wrong. I'm not just building up a lot of information that you can share with other people. But if that information is going in and there's action taken upon it, even in the simplest of ways, then that's someone who's obeying everything that he said. And when you became born again, you wanted to. You wanted to. You, you, you have a heart to, even though you fail at times. That's what a disciple does. He or she follows Christ and seeks to obey him and sometimes fails. But Christ lifts them up and encourages them to continue on. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, sometimes you might ask the question, well, I might know somebody who says that they know, know the Lord but ha has no desire to do what he says. Well, this verse will help bring understanding to that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, we know that we have come to know him. How do you know that you've come to know him? If we obey his commands. It's a real simple test. Not that you're obeying so that he'll receive you and accept you and say, good job, you've worked your way right up into my good graces. No. If you are born again, you want to do what he says. And you will have a lifestyle that produces habits that does what he says. The man who says, I know him, in verse 4, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. That's not someone who's born again. That's not someone who knows God. See? It's not like someone can lose their salvation. Sometimes people do, do things that God hates, even though they're saved, but they feel it. Deep. You might have been in that position at some point where you're hating where you are because you know God doesn't want you to live that way. You see? Calling you to, to the life that he, he wants you to live, but you would never say that you shouldn't be doing what he says. You just hate yourself for not doing it. Well, the verse says in Matthew 28, make disciples of all nations. All nations. I want to focus on that for a minute. Every group of people on this planet, every group of people around the world, he wants to know him. And so look at Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is uh, right at the beginning uh, of... Uh, of this book of Acts, which is really uh, the description or the uh, um, uh, narrative of how the church began and then began to grow and spread on the earth. You have Luke, who wrote 
uh, the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote Acts. It's like part one and part two. Here's the Gospel of Christ. He's raised from the dead. Now what do we do with it? Now the believers are left behind, and what are they doing with it in Acts? And right at the beginning, we have an outline for the book of Acts, I guess, if you were to look at it this way. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is Jesus speaking. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in, Jude and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from his sight, their sight. This is an outline of the book of Acts. And if you want to look at it, it's a concentric circles. Jerusalem is the epicenter. And then Judea is the greater area around Jerusalem. And then Samaria is beyond that. And then you have the ends of the earth. Uh, and Paul, even at one point, wanted to go to Spain. He talked about going to Spain in Romans chapter 15. That was the ends of the known world for him at that time. He got this. He got what Jesus wanted him to do. And, uh, and the question's asked, what about those who have never heard about Jesus somewhere on another part of the earth? And by the way, the United States of America is the other end of the earth from where this, this all began, isn't it? And there are people in this world who don't know Jesus and have never had an opportunity to learn about him. Um, the question's asked, what about those who have never heard about Jesus? Look in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. The Apostle Paul um, you know, Romans 10, 9, if you've ever memorized that or are familiar with it, he, uh, he says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just a short while after that, in verse 14, how then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let me ask you a question. Do you have beautiful feet? Smell your neighbor's feet and say, nice. By the way, why are we told to bring the message to people? Why are we told to bring the message to people? Because people will go to hell unless they put their faith in Christ. That's why. That's very clear in the scriptures. And you might be reacting to that right now, going, what, what about those people that never heard, never even had the opportunity, never even had the chance? Do you understand what it means to be born in sin and deserve an eternity apart from God? That's the condition of this world. And if I believe that God would just, uh, you know, oh, they have never had the opportunity to hear. Uh, you know, no one ever went to them, so I'm going to put them in a special category of people and they're just going to experience my mercy and I'll just overlook their sins because they've never heard. If that was the case, you know what I'd tell you today? Don't ever open your mouth about Jesus. Don't ever open your mouth about Jesus. You know why? Because if you never open your mouth about Jesus and there's someone out there that has never heard Leave them that way so that God would have special mercy on them, you see. So that he would put them in that category of people that he would go, oh, you've never heard. So you know what I'll do? I'll just overlook your sin and I'll let you in because no one ever brought the message to you. If that were the case, I just shut your mouth. Don't ever talk about Jesus. It'd be better for people. But that's not the case, is it? We are told to go. Because there's a real hell. And people really are guilty of sin. And they need an answer. They need a solution. That's why. Look at John 3.16. Very simple one, right? For God so loved the world, He loves people, that He gave His only Son. Why? Why? that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, what you want to do is you want to contrast eternal life with perish. They're on the same level. Either someone's going to live eternally or they're going to perish eternally. That's not like someone's just going to die and they're never going to get a chance to go to heaven and that's it. That's it. No more. They're annihilated. Their spirit isn't going to live any longer. 
No, that's not what perishing is. Perishing is, is living forever apart from God. That's what perishing is. And he came so that we could live forever and not perish forever because he loves us. That's why Jesus came. <clears throat> First John chapter 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God. Oh, Lord, I've loved you enough. Will you accept me? Yes, my son, you've done a good job. Come on up here. That's not how he does it. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In other words, his wrath is turned aside for our sin because Jesus took our place and God judged Jesus instead of us for our sins. That's how, that's how intensely he understands that unless someone puts their faith in what he's done for us, that they will perish forever. That's the cost, you see. He sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In Romans 6, 23, we find this as well. For the wages of sin is death. Notice the contrast. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, someone can live forever because they have a relationship with Jesus based on their, their faith in what he's done for them. Thank you, Lord, that you took my place. You were punished instead of me and that you're alive now. I want you. I trust you. Now you live eternally. But what's the opposite of that? The wages of sin is death. That's what people get for doing it their way, for leaving God behind them, saying, I'll do it the way I feel like doing it. I don't care about you, Lord. I'll do whatever I feel like. See, the wages of sin is death. And that's eternal death contrasted with eternal life. Either someone's going to die eternally or they will live eternally. That's why we have a message. And you know what I believe? I believe that God will move heaven and earth to bring that message to someone who is really crying out for God. But you don't have a world full of people saying, I really, really want you, Lord. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. In other words, you understand that God is powerful and that He's intelligent. How? Anyone can. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You can be someone living in a tribe somewhere halfway around the world and understand this. How? Having been clearly seen, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. There's no one on the face of the earth who can examine their bodies, look at this world around them and go, something doesn't come from nothing in the absence of an intelligent designer who's powerful. Something doesn't come from nothing. It's very simple reasoning. How does something come from nothing? There has to be an eternal and powerful an intelligent first cause of all things that exists outside of time and space that willed it to happen. There has to be. If someone is saying, Lord, I know you exist. I want to know you. What do you think God's response to that is going to be? If he knows that this message needs to be brought to them? Look at Jeremiah chapter 29, 13. This is, a, this is a, some, a statement made to Israel, the nation of Israel, but it, in principle in, is something that applies to everyone, I believe. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He doesn't hide himself from someone who really wants to know him. If someone is crying out for the message, I believe God will move heaven and earth to bring that message to him, and I believe that will come to them in some form. And you read about it coming to them in visions. You read about it coming to them in some publication, some form of media, someone who comes into their life and shares it with them. See? At the end of time, you'll notice that the job gets done, by the way, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Look at what he says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. This is after, at the end of the Bible, at the end of all things. You are worthy. Speaking to Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men 
for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Every language and tribe and people and nation. He wants to know him. I remember um, uh, a while ago uh, when we took a trip as college students down to Daytona Beach during spring break. And, uh, you know, the students down there were, were doing anything they could to experience pleasure in life. That's what it was all about. Squeeze pleasure out of this life in many different forms, getting drunk and all kinds of stuff, right? And so we went down as a group to share Christ with these people at that time. And uh, yeah, we would talk to people in different situations and had a wonderful time, just uh, some conversations with folks. And, and um, I remember this guy coming down the hallway while we were getting ready to go to bed. He was kind of feeling the wall because he was drunk and, uh, you know, walking slowly. And, and uh, I was looking at another guy across from me. He says, well, why don't we just share Christ with this guy? And so he came down, and, and uh, right before we went to bed, we, we said, hey, can we talk to you for a moment? And we brought up the subject to him, and, and uh, he stopped us. He said, he was kind of drunk. He said, he said you know, I, I used to do what you guys are doing. I used to do it all the time. He said, I'm a Christian. He said, I, I don't know what happened. He said, I don't know what happened. He said, I, but, you know, keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. And he just kind of felt the wall as he was walking towards his room and went in his room. He was a Christian. And there he was down there. For a different purpose. Squeezing every ounce of pleasure he could get out of life. And I thought the contrast was obvious. Here we were down there with a different purpose. Trying to help people find real life. Not false life that God gives. That uh, they find in this world. But real life. And here he was just caught up in the whole mess. The whole dripping sinful mess. With a different purpose. The question under this point is, where are your feet going today? Where are your feet going today? And last, I want to share this. Trust that Jesus will never abandon you. Trust that Jesus will never abandon you. Uh, you know, before all this stuff that came out about Bill Cosby and his, you know, indiscretion in many areas, um, he, he was respected and he wrote a book called Fatherhood. And I... I I love this quote, so I'm just going to read it to you from his book. Years ago, he wrote, So you've decided to have a child. You've decided to give up quiet evenings with good books and lazy weekends with good music, intimate meals during which you finish whole sentences, sweet private times when you've savored the thought that just the two of you and your love are all you will ever need. You've decided to turn your sofas into trampolines and to abandon the joys of leisurely contemplating reproductions of great art for the joys of frantically coping with the reproductions of yourselves. Why? And he goes on. He says, Poets have said that the reason to have children is to give yourself immortality. And I must admit, I did ask God to give me a son because I wanted someone to carry on the family name. Well, God did just that. And now I confess that there have been times I've told my son not to reveal who he is. <laughs> you make up a name, I've said. Just don't tell anybody whose son you are. <laughs> you know, you know look, at, look at Matthew 28, verse 20. He says this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you always to the very end of the age. He promises his presence with us continually. If you're a follower of Christ today... He never leaves you. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, we're told this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, what? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You need nothing else. You need me. And I'm telling you, I will never leave you, is what God says. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And by the way, that's the, that's the question that needs to be answered by people who 
want to attempt to share Christ with somebody else because we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid someone might push, push us away. We're afraid of feeling like we're inadequate and that we, we don't measure up to maybe their standards and they're rejecting us. But in reality, what does he say here? The Lord is my help. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Who's the constant companion in your life? The true and living God. He's the one who will never leave you or forsake you. I found this early one morning. A father was awakened by a smoke detector in his basement. He, he woke his wife and they quickly went to their children's bedroom and woke them up and started heading for the door through the smoke, which was getting quite heavy. The father was carrying his one-and-a-half-year-old daughter in one arm and held the hand of his four-year-old son with the other. The son, being scared and unsure of what was happening, pulled his hand from his father's clasp and ran to what he thought was a place of safety, a corner of his bedroom where his favorite stuffed toys were kept. The father got outside with the daughter and called to his son, who appeared at the bedroom window crying and calling for help. The father called to him and told him to jump. But the boy yelled in reply, But I can't see you. And then the father called back with a reassuring message, That's all right. I can see you. And the boy jumped. See? You know, that's how we are in this world. We can't see him. I want to see you. But he reassures us in many other different ways. Through his voice, through his word, that he's there. And he's worth trusting. He's worth jumping out of the window into his arms when he asks us to do certain things. And so, trust that Jesus will never abandon you as you seek to do what he wants in this life. I'm going to close today uh, just by mentioning a couple of things that happened on our trip. You know, uh, we visited an area of China uh, some cities along a certain uh, path in the Ningxia province where there were millions of people, millions of people who, who uh, had never heard an explanation of the gospel message. There are very few people in these areas. They're called unreached people groups. And uh, uh, not being able, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll throw the first picture up there. This is, you know, you can, you can see this marketplace forget those two weirdos at the bottom but uh, <coughs> you know you can see the marketplace behind us just packed with people packed with people in that particular city and uh, uh, you know it was overwhelming as a matter of fact you know as, you, as, as we were walking among them understanding that there are very few people there who could present a message like, like you've heard today to them they haven't heard. You know, the next picture, uh, a, a lot of people have grown up in, uh, in the Hui people have grown up uh, never, uh, never hearing about Jesus because they've grown up in Islam, in China. And, and these folks are very friendly, very willing to communicate, and would listen to a presentation of the gospel and a conversation uh, of friendship. But, uh, but the, you would see mosques and, and places of worship everywhere that you went. Uh, they don't believe that Jesus died for their sins. They believe that he's a great prophet, but they don't believe he died for their sins. In fact, they would get angry when you would mention that he, would, he was actually crucified on the cross. You know, but it wasn't until we were flying back from uh, uh, a city named Xi'an back to... Um, uh, back to Shanghai, where you know the plane was full of Chinese people, uh, that uh, that uh, I think God really uh, helped me understand some things. This is a, a friend I made on the plane. Now I'm sitting right behind Terry, who is by the window, and we're by I'm by the window, and uh, this is a Chinese man who sat down next to me. And by the way, they they loved they love Americans. They they want their pictures taken with you, and you know they. They, uh, they just get a kick out of the fact that you're from America. And so um, he sat down next to me and he said, <clears throat> he said, hello. I go, well, you speak English. 
He said, I do actually. And I said, well, great. Now I can have a conversation with him. And uh, we had a, a wonderful time. I got to know him a little bit. I asked him about spiritual life in China. He said, what spiritual life? He said, we don't think about these things. He said, I grew up uh, never, never thinking about these things. I asked him, have you ever seen a Bible before? He said, I've never seen a Bible. I said, has anyone ever shared with you anything about Christianity, about Jesus? He said, I've never heard that before. He said, uh, he said, we grew up with nothing. That's what he said. And, and, and then he stopped me, and he smiled, and uh, there was an advertisement on the back of the seats, and there was an English word money on the back of the seat. He pointed at it and said, this is what we think about all the time. Money. He was saying it in a sense that that was his God. You see. And uh, as we're in this conversation, the guy in front of... Uh, him in the seat sitting next to Terry because Terry had been doodling on a sheet of paper for him. Terry had drawn a cross and the, the, the symbol of the fish. He's trying to communicate with this guy who can't speak English too well about Jesus, right? So the guy next to him is holding this piece of paper and he turns around and he makes friends with the guy that I'm talking to and he says, what does this mean? You know, he understood the cross but he didn't know what the fish was. And so my friend asked me, you know, what, what, what that's all about. So I explained to him. Christians were killed, and this was how they identified themselves uh, as believers. They would draw one side of the fish, and someone else would draw the other side of the fish. And uh, it's an acrostic that means Jesus Christ, Son uh, of God and Savior. And uh, uh, he communicated that back to the guy in front of him, and Terry continued to talk to him. I asked the guy next to me, would you be willing to hear a simple presentation of what it means to know God? as I understand it, and as taught in the Bible. He said, yeah. So I shared the gospel with him, and uh, he said, these are some good things to think about. And I'm sitting there with my Bible in my bag. Uh, it's my Bible, the one that I use at home, and <clears throat> my study Bible. And I'm, I'm starting to think to myself, this guy will never, this guy will never hear, uh, he will never, he will never, he will never get a Bible. He won't get a Bible. I'm thinking to myself, no one's going to bring one to him. My Bible is the only one he'll probably be the, the closest to in his whole life. And so I, I asked him, would you like a gift from me? It's my personal Bible. Uh, and he, his eyes got real big. He goes, you would give that to me? And I said, could you imagine someone in our country saying that? I can give you a Bible, my personal Bible. <gasps> you would give that to me? That wouldn't happen here. So I, I took it out of the bag, and I'm starting to feel like, we shouldn't even be doing this. These are Chinese people. I shouldn't be proselytizing in China like this openly anyway. And so uh, I said, is it okay? He said, oh, yeah. So I pulled it out, and he grabbed it, and he put it on his lap. And he looked at me and said, thank you. And he opened it up, and I said, here's where you need to start reading. I told him where to read the red, all that stuff, and, and uh, start on the New Testament and uh, uh, consider the words of Christ. I showed, pointed him some verses for him. And uh, the guy in front of him, you know, was over over here in this conversation. And as he's talking to Terry, uh, they start talking in Chinese. All right. And uh, pretty soon, um, my Bible gets passed to him, <laughs> gets passed down the aisle to his wife, who's sitting across the aisle from in front of all the other Chinese people on the plane. And uh, and I'm saying, oh man. And uh, uh, and then it gets passed back, right? And he holds it, and he turns to me and says, she, uh, she has read a part of the Bible one time. She's read part of the Bible one time. And uh, oh, great, great. And so we took this picture, and uh, I, he, I asked if I could pray for him, and I did. And, and he looked at me. He never heard anyone pray before. And he looked at me and said, thank you. And so pray for Ma Chiang, you know. Uh, just one of many people in a place that don't, that don't have an opportunity to hear the message. And Terry and I are going to be sharing at a future time about how we can pers personally be involved as a church in interacting with uh, the people of that land. So, Father, we, we come to you and we thank you that you love us. But not only us, that you love this world around us. And so many people that you care about living in darkness. I ask that we as your people would uh, consider what you would have each of us do 
maybe there's someone in our life that we know who doesn't know you yet. Ask that we would be motivated to take uh, bold steps of faith to just bring the subject up or to reach out to them and take the time to do that. And that uh, you would, in that process, convince each person here that you never leave or forsake them and that, that your smile is worth more than someone else's disapproval of us. I uh, thank you that you love us and that you've done something to save us. And Lord, I, I ask for anyone here in this room who might not know you. They're thinking about what, uh, what your involvement in their life is. They're here today. They're considering things. I ask that you would do a deep and lasting work in their heart. That you would open their eyes. That they would see you as you really are. And understand that they need you to save them. Lord Jesus. I'd like you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment and your eyes closed. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or anything, but maybe you don't know him today and you're convinced of that right now. And you know that you need to. Jesus took your place. As I said before, he was punished instead of you. Because that's the only way that your sin will be paid for and forgiven. But what's required of us is for us to trust Him. Not to do anything, but to trust what God has done for us. And to put our faith in Him. And he calls us to have a conversation with Him, to put our confidence in Him. Re Revelation 3.20, this is Jesus after He's raised from the dead, says this, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. He wants to know you and have fellowship with you, but he's not going to bust into your life. He needs you to tell him thank you and invite him in. Maybe you're ready to do that. I'm going to pray a simple prayer, and if you want to follow in your heart, thinking, yeah, that's exactly what I want to say, then go ahead and do that and talk to God. Lord Jesus, I need you. I've done things that you hate. I've had my back turned to you. I've been living my life the way I want to live it. And I'm sorry, Lord. Will you forgive me? Would you come into my life? Would you change me? I want to live for you. In your great name, Lord Jesus, amen.